Hello, I'm Desmond Edagese, your math teacher for today. Today I'll be taking you on a theme, number and numeration. And our topic for today is simple equations and variations part one. It means that we'll be having two series of videos for this topic. Let's go on. Now in this class, there are certain things that I expect us to have learned at the end of our lesson. We'll have a brief introduction to what equations are. Just a reminder, I know we already know what equations are. We'll also look at the change of subject or formula. In most equations, they are, you may have two or more variables. Okay? When you have such and you have a need to put particular emphasis on a variable, we carry out what we know as the change of subject or formula. Next, we'll look at direct variation, and we'll also go ahead to look at inverse variation. It promises to be an exciting class. Are you ready? Let's go on. Now, equations. If I were to ask you, what do you understand by the word equation? Okay, let's remind ourselves. A mathematical equation is an expression, that is a mathematical expression, containing at least one variable. That is your unknown value represented by a letter, most times, in maths. Okay? And an equal to sign or symbol with a mathematical expression on either side of your equal to sign. All of that gives us what we know as an equation. So an equation is made up of at least one or more variable, and you also have an equal to sign with two mathematical expressions on either side of your equal to sign. Now the equal to sign simply tells us something. It tells us that the value on both sides are exactly equal. Okay? Let's take an example of the different kind of equations that we may have, or some of them. Okay? X is equal to zero. It's an equation. You have one variable, which is x. You have two expressions on either side of your equal to sign. So this qualifies as an equation. Also, you could have more complex one like this. 3y squared plus 76 is equal to 42. So all of this is an expression, while this is also another expression. On either side of your equal to sign, you have one variable here. Some instance, you may have two or even more variables. Also, here's another example of an equation. x is equal to 12.5. Whatever expressions are on either side of your equal to sign, the equal to sign tells us that they are exactly of the same value. So now, we've reminded ourselves what equations are. Let's go ahead to see how we can change the subject of formula. A formula is simply an equation, now that we know what an equation is. But this formula specifies, it's specific, how a number of variables are related to one another. Okay, so they are written in a way that a single variable, which we will call the subject of the formula, the subject of that equation, is on the left-hand side of the equation, okay? Every other thing goes to the right-hand side of the equation. So if we have this formula here, of course, this formula is an equation that specifies how all of these variables are related. We have one, two, three, four variables, okay? And we have one particular variable that is situated on the left side of our mathematical expression or formula, while every other variable is on the right-hand side. This variable here, V, is the subject of this formula. Now, you may have a need to make U or A or T, which are other variables in this formula, to become the subject of the formula. The purpose of this particular lesson here is to show us how we can change this subject of the formula, which is V for now, 
and instead make u the subject of the formula, or a the subject of our formula, or even t to become the subject of the formula. So to find an unknown value, for instance, v that is the subject of the formula, our purpose is to find the value of v. Okay? It means, therefore, that we would know what the value of u, a, and t is, and we'll simply carry out our addition on the variables to get our value. If we were to make u the subject of the formula, it simply means also that we are looking for the value of u. Hence, v will be known, a and t will also be known, and our u becomes the unknown. So we can swap or switch either of our variables here to become the subject in place of v. We'll see exactly how we can do that. There are certain steps to follow okay, to change the subject of a particular formula. Step one, take note of the variable, you know, that we intend to make the subject of the formula. Take, for instance, the formula we just saw, V is equal to U plus A T. Now, if we were to make U the subject of this formula, of course, V right now is the subject of our formula. If we were to make U the subject of the formula, following our step, first, we said begin with the variable to begin the, the new subject. So we highlight our variable there. Take good note of that. Next, we say apply inverse operations as for solving equations in the opposite order to the other convention. Apply inverse Operations. Take note of this term, inverse operations. Okay, you come across it a lot in our topic, changing of subject or formula. Now, the operation in this formula is what? Plus. But in relation to the specific variable we're interested in, we have all of this operation, plus AT. So the subject we seek is u, and every other thing is plus a t. We seek to find the inverse of this operation, OK? And we apply that to the formula. So the inverse operation simply refers to the opposite operation you know, in the formula. In this case, we have a plus a t. So the inverse would be a minus a t. Take note that we will carry out this operation on either side of our expression, that is, on either side of the equal to sign. So we have v minus at is equal to u plus at, and then our inverse operation minus at. The purpose, okay, is to isolate a variable in question. Okay, this is the variable we're interested in making our subject. So we want to isolate it. In order to do that, okay, we carry out an inverse operation of all that is, you know, to the right or by the side of our variable. So plus at minus at, of course, that cancels out. And we'll have u alone. So we have u is equal to v minus at. So we've managed, okay, to isolate u, thereby making it the subject of our formula v is u plus at has been converted and u has become the subject of the formula in place of v. Take note that u was on the right side, but in mathematical convention, it is swapped Ensure that the subject is always on the left side of your equation. The subject is always on the left side of your equation. Let's take some quick examples on how to solve questions on the change of subject of formula. Okay? If you were asked to make x, the subject of the formula a is equal to b, all in brackets, 1 minus x. Following the steps, you know, that we highlighted earlier, all right? What do we do? Remember, we talked about 
inverse operations. But before we do that, in any question generally given to you, always try to clear out the bracket, that is, open up the brackets. Okay, so we'll first do that. So we have A is equal to B, all in bracket, 1 minus X. So first, we clear out our brackets by what? Multiplying B and 1 and B and X. So A is what? B minus B X. All right? So now we have A is equal to B minus B X. Next, what do we do? We carry out an inverse operation. Our intention, remember, is to isolate X to become the subject. So in our path to do that, whatever we need to, okay, we carry out inverse operations. So we need to isolate, for instance, this product BX on one end. Let's see how we can do that. So we have A is equal to B minus BX. Remember, our intention is to isolate X on the other end of our equation. So to do that, let's quickly add, add BX to both sides. That's an inverse operation of minus BX. So we're adding BX to both sides. We'll have A plus BX is B minus BX plus BX. Of course, this cancels out. And we'll have B. So we have B isolated on one end. But the goal is to get X isolated. So again, to leave our BX alone, isolated on one end, what do we do? We subtract A from both sides. A plus BX minus A will cancel out A to have BX alone. And of course, we have B minus A. So BX is B minus A. Now, we have our bx on one end but again we need just the x so what do we do to free our x from the b that makes it a product we carry out the inverse operation of the multiplication of b and then that will give us a division by b so you divide both sides of the equation by b dividing both sides will be bx over b bx over b all over b minus a over b B cancels out to have X isolated, which we've been seeking all along. And then we have B minus A all over B as a final answer. So we succeeded in making X the subject of our formula. Let's try another question. Make X again the subject of the formula. B is equal to half square root of all in bracket A square minus A square. Okay. So X is our goal. But first, when you have questions, especially that have denominators, that is, that are fractions, what do you do? You try to clear the fractions, okay? And in order to do that, you carry out an inverse operation. So you have a division by 2, as you can see in the question. To carry out the inverse operation, that will be a multiplication. The inverse of addition is a subtraction. The inverse of a multiplication is a division, okay? The inverse of a square root is a square, and so on. So it's important that you know many of the inverses of certain operations. So we do carry out the inverse operation of division by 2, and that's a multiplication by 2. Simply said, multiply both sides by 2. Okay? When we do that, we'll have b times 2 is what? 2 times half. Square root of all in bracket a square minus x square. Okay? So 2 cancels out. So we succeeded in taking off our fraction. So we can have equations that are on a line. This gives us 2b. And of course, square root all in bracket a square minus x square. Fine, all right? Next step is to also find a way to remove our square roots. Remember, we just mentioned that the inverse operation of a square root is a square and vice versa. So we could square both sides of the equation. And if we do that, we'll find that we'll also remove our square root here. So square both sides of the equation. That is, raise both sides to the power of 2. 
So you have 2b, all in brackets squared, and all of these square roots, all raised to the power of 2. Now raise the power 2, the exponent 2, and the square roots cancels out. They are opposite operations, so they cancel out. And what we have here is a squared minus x squared. And in this left-hand side, we have 4b squared. 4b squared is a squared minus x squared. Okay, so we're getting closer. What next to do? We can add, remember we seek to isolate x on the left side of our uh, equation. So we can add x squared to both sides of the equation. So add x squared to both sides. We have 4b squared plus x squared is equal to a squared because minus x squared plus x squared on the right hand side, our x squared cancel out to leave out our a squared. So we have 4b squared plus x squared is equal to a squared. Next, to also isolate our x again, we subtract 4b squared from both sides. So if we do that, 4b squared minus 4b squared on the left-hand side cancels out. And we have a squared minus 4b squared on the right-hand side. We are almost done with finding okay, the value of our x, or to making x the subject of our formula. So the last thing to do is to do the inverse operation of any operation that's presently existing on x. x is raised to the power of 2. So to get x alone, we need to find the inverse operation, which is the square root of x squared. The square root of x squared will give us x. But remember, we are finding the square root of both sides. So we also find the square root of all the terms on the right-hand side of our equation. Square root of x squared is x. And square root of a squared minus 4b squared is written thus. Plus or minus square root of a squared minus 4b squared. And that's our answer. Now let's take another quick example. Make y the subject of the formula. We have three square roots, all in bracket y over a is equal to b. y is the variable we're interested in. Okay? So first, we carry out an inverse operation to clear out the power. That is to clear out this cube root. Okay? And how do we do that? We raise the both sides to the power 3, which is the inverse operation of the cube root. If we do that, we'll have all of that gone. y over a is isolated, is equal to b to the power of 3. Now, to find y, which we are interested in, we'll find that y is divided by a. Now, we want to carry out the inverse operation to isolate y. And that inverse operation will be a multiplication of both sides by a. So, y over a times a is equal to b cubed times a. b cubed times a. So, a cancels a. y is isolated. And you have a b cubed. That's our answer quickly. Also, finally, we we'll take this last one. If u is 1 minus 3v all over vt minus w, make t the subject of the formula. Of course, we'll start looking for operations that we can carry out, our inverse operations, in order to isolate t to be the subject. So quickly, we first again try to simplify your formula. You can see we have a fraction. Try to simplify it so you have, you know, equations on one line instead of a fraction. So how do we do that? Vt minus w is the denominator, okay? We need, therefore, to multiply both sides by Vt minus w so that they can cancel out and then we'll have equations on a line. All right? So we multiply both sides, u times Vt over w. And then if we multiply this, that is 1 minus 3v all over vt minus w. These are all separate terms. 1 is a term of itself. 
3 v all over vt minus w is another term. So if you multiply all sides by vt minus w, it means that we'll have 1 times vt minus w. And then 3v over vt minus w times vt over w, vt minus w, this cancels out to leave us 3v isolated. So all of this on the right side is equal to ru multiplied by vt minus w on the left hand side. So now it's a bit clearer. Our Main search is to look for T isolated on the left side. So let's see what X we can do. Let's open up the brackets first. So you have U, VT here, minus U, W. Still equal to VT minus W minus 3V. Okay? Collecting like terms, we have U, VT, and VT. Okay, which you can bring together. We also have UW and W, which are also similar. So what do we do? If we carry all of this to the other side of our equation, okay, it becomes positive. So we have UVT. Why we carry this to the other side? And we have a negative. UVT minus VT is equal to UW minus W minus 3V. So now we have similar terms. If we collect like terms, T is common. You have UV, and then you have V. Is equal to UW minus W minus 3V. Now, we can easily find our T. If we carry out an inverse operation on this bracketed terms, that's UV minus V, okay? The inverse would be a division. So we simply divide both sides by UV minus V. Of course, this cancels out to isolate our T. T is there for UW minus W minus 3V all over UV minus V. So T is our subject of formula. And it gives us UW minus W minus 3V all over UV minus V. Now, all that we've learned so far, it's quite very important because from what we'll be learning now, we'll see that this knowledge is applied in various parts of algebra and maths and in other parts of mathematics as we'll come across. Now we move on to our next topic, direct variation. Direct variation. What exactly is direct variation? Now when two variables are related directly, the ratio of their values is always the same. That is that one value goes up, the other value also goes up, you know, along with it in the same ratio and proportion. Now, the symbol for proportionality, okay, is this. This is the symbol. And it simply indicates here that Y is directly proportional to X. So Y is directly proportional to X. As the variable Y increases, X also increases in the same ratio. This is what this expression here is telling us. The relationship between such variables, okay, is what we call direct variation. So, the relationship here is a direct variation relationship. And the equation is written in this form, y is equals to kx, where k is a constant of proportionality. K is the constant of proportionality. Now, there are steps to solving direct variation questions. Let's see the steps. We have two methods. First, we have the formula method. Then we have the proportion method. In the formula method, first, we find or we derive K 
from our formula y is equals to kx. The example we gave earlier, we said y is directly proportional to x, right? And then we said the equation is written as y is equals to kx, where k is our constant of proportionality. So if we have that particular expression, y is k over x, first try to solve for k, to get the value of the proportion or the constant of proportionality. k is y over x. If you have a value, say 10, then get the model equation. For example, y in this case is 10x. This is the model equation. All we simply did was to replace k with the value that we calculated as 10. So y is 10x. This would be our model equation. Third step, plug in your known variables. That is the values that you are given. For example, if you are given the value x, you need to get the unknown y. Plug in the variable into this uh, model. x is given, plug in the value of x, multiply by 10, and that will give us the value of y. And then we've gone ahead to find the unknown value. That's one method. Another method, okay, which is a bit faster, is called the proportion method. We simply create two ratios. Remember what we said about direct variations, okay? We said they are directly related in a manner that if one variable goes up, the other goes up with it in the same proportion. So if we have a value y1 and another value x1, if we have another value y2 and x2, these variables are directly related. It means that as this increases, they increase. So they are equal to one another. With this knowledge, you can quickly create two ratios from whatever values, you know, given in your question. The next step is to set them to be equal to each other. And finally, solve for the missing quantity. Now we're going to carry out some examples for better understanding. If M, okay, is directly proportional to N. So remember our symbol, wherever you see it, it means that it's proportional. In this case, it's directly proportional. So M is proportional or directly proportional to n, and m is 10, when n is 6. Find n when m is 15. So we know that because they are proportional to each other, whatever value we have for one ratio is equal to the other. m and n related, okay? The equation of that relationship is m is equal to kn. k being what? A constant of proportionality. So if we impute the value of m, which we were given to be 10 in our formula here, we have 10 is equal to k, and n was also given to us to be 6. So 10 is equal to k6. To find our k, Remember, in the first method, we said try to get the value for k. If we already know the value of the two variables okay, in the equation, we can easily find k. k in this instance will be 10 divided by 6. That is, if we divide both sides by 6 to isolate k, just like we learned earlier, we are carrying out an inverse operation on this end. k, we want to be the subject of our formula. So the inverse operation would be dividing both sides by 6. 10 divided by 6 will isolate k for us. So k is 10 over 6, and that's 5 over 3. So now we have the value of k. We go to make a model equation. Okay? We said m is kn. Remember? Now we have a value for k. We simply impute that value. So m is 5 over 3n. This is our model equation. Now that we know our model equation, the next step is to do what? Plug in the known values into the model to find the unknown. So the known values are m, which is 15. So we impute whatever we see m, we put 15. It means 15 is equal to 5n over 3. n is our unknown. We are asked to find n. So now we have 15 is equal to 5n over 3. Okay? From what we learned earlier, n 
is what we intend to make the subject of the formula. And of course, how do we do that? We carry out inverse operation. So we multiply both sides by 3. If we do that, we have 5n is 15 times 3. Because 5n over 3 times 3, 3 will cancel out 3 to give us 5n isolated. But n alone is what we seek to make the subject of the formula. So again, we carry out another inverse operation, dividing both sides by 5. So 15 times 3 gives us 45. Divided by 5 will give us 9. n has been isolated to become the subject of our formula. And the value for n is 9. All right, let's try another one. If y varies directly as x, and y is 24 when x is 16, find y when x is 12. Let's try the second method. Remember, we learned two methods. In the second method, OK, we said we simply equate two different ratios together and go ahead to solve the unknown. So let's try to get the first ratio. Y to X, okay, Y has been given to us as 24, Y X is 16. So the ratio Y to X is what? 24 all over 16. But we have another ratio, okay, which is what? Another Y and X value, but the Y is yet unknown, but we know the value for X. So we set up another ratio which is y all over x. x is given to us as 12. So y over 12 is our second ratio. Our question tells us that both ratios vary directly. It means, therefore, that they are equal to one another. 24 over 16 is equal to y over 12. So we equate them together. If we can do this, now we have a formula that we can use. So find y, because we simply need to do what? Make y the subject of our formula from what we have learned. We have y over 12 on one end, and our purpose is to isolate y. What do we do? We carry out inverse operation and multiply both sides by 12. So if we multiply y over 12 by 12, 12 cancels 12, and we isolate y alone to be 24 over 16 times 12. All of this value gives us 18. Y is 18. Let's do some word problems. Because some of the questions that may be given to you in your exams may be questions that are word-based. So you need to use your intellect to try to analyze what the question is saying and how to go about to solve it. Let's take one quickly. The money raised at a school fundraiser is directly proportional. So we have an idea. Okay, what kind of variation is this? This is a direct variation question. It's directly proportional to the number of people. So take note, money raised. Number of people who attend. Last year, the amount of money raised for 100 attendees was 2,500 naira. How much money will be raised if 1,000 people attend this year? Okay, so with the knowledge that we have, we try to write down the variables for our question. We say let y represent the amount of money raised. Let x represent the number of attendees. Okay, so these are the two important factors in our question. And again, now that we have x and y, let's read the question again. It said the money raised at this fundraiser is directly proportional. So money raised, which is y, is directly proportional to the number of people. The number of attendees is x. So now we can say y is directly proportional to x. And of course, we can use either of the two formulas that we know. Okay? Let's try and make use of the second formula we learned about, the proportion formula. So we quickly carry out two ratios. First ratio will be for the first values we are given. Last year, the amount of money raised was 2,500 naira. So we have 25. For how many attendees? 100 attendees. So 2,500 all over 100. That's one ratio. 
Our question tells us that it should be equal to the next ratio, which we're going to look at. How much money will be raised if 1,000 people attend this year? So we have the number of people. X, that will be X2, to so be 1,000. But what we don't know is the amount of money that will be raised. Why? This year. So we have two ratios. One for last year and one for this year. Last year has already taken place. And we have facts. 2,500 naira for 100 attendees. So 2,500 over 100 is one ratio. This year, we do not know how much will be raised for 1,000 people. But we do know that the relationship is directly proportional. So therefore, we can go ahead to equate them to be equal. 2,500 over 100 is equal to y over 1,000. We make y the subject of the formula. And of course, y is the amount of money we have raised. So what do we do? We multiply both sides by 1,000. That is our inverse operation. y is 2,500 times 1,000 all over 100. And that will give us 25,000. So why is 25,000 naira? 25,000 naira will be raised if 1,000 people attend our event, our fundraiser event this year. So we see that direct variation, okay, is something that we come across every day. And with this knowledge, you can easily solve problems relating to it. Let's take another question. Bisola, but... An energy efficient washing machine for her new apartment. If she saves about 10 gallons of water per load, how many gallons of water will she save if she washes 20 loads of laundry? Okay? If you read through the question quickly, you'll find that we have a direct proportion relationship. A direct proportion relationship. The machine is energy efficient, okay? And it saves a particular amount of water for every load. So, how much water will be saved if she washes 20 loads? It's a direct proportional question. So, quickly, let's write out variables for uh, known and unknown. What we do know is that the amount of gallons of water saved, okay, is one factor. Let Y represent that factor. X, let X represent the number of load, that is the load of clothes. So let's set up the proportion. The machine is designed, okay, to save 10 gallons of water per load. So we set up that ratio. 10 gallons all over one load. That's the ratio. Now, the question is, how many gallons will be saved if she washes 20 loads? So we know the number of loads, 20, but we don't know the quantity or the number of gallons of water, which we've said, let Y represent that number. So we have our relationship set up thus. 10 over 1, okay, is the same ratio as Y over 20. They are directly proportional. So we can simply equate them one to another. 10 over 1 is equal to y over 20. So now easily we can make y the subject of our formula by carrying out inverse operations on this equation. What do we do? We multiply both sides by 20. y over 20 times 20, of course. 20 cancels out 20 to give us y isolated, while 10 over 1 times 20 is 200. So y is 200. That is y is 200 gallons of water saved. Another type of variation that we have is called the inverse variation. The inverse variation. What is the inverse variation? The inverse or the indirect variation refers to a relationship between two variables that go in the opposite direction. Okay? So as one goes up, the other goes down. Can you quickly think of one kind of relationship like that? Okay? The speed, okay? the velocity, the speed of your car. The more speed that you have, 
the less time it takes to get to your destination. Okay, so if you drive at a higher speed, 100 kilometers per hour, it may take you two minutes. But if you drive at a lower speed, it may take you more time. So if you drive at five kilometers per hour, it will take you one hour to get to your destination. That kind of relationship is called an inverse or indirect variation. All right, I'm sure you can think of other examples. Now, our symbol is also used here, proportional. But in this case, since it's indirect or inverse, you have one all over whatever value. So y is inversely proportional to x. And this is how we write that expression. y is inversely proportional to x. So once you see 1 over x, you know that it's an inverse operation, or 1 all over whatever value is an inverse operation. y is inversely proportional to x. OK, the equation is y is equal to k all over x. k, again, is a constant of proportionality. Let's take a look at the steps to solving questions on inverse variation. Again, just like our direct variation, we have two methods. First method is the formula method. In the formula method, we quickly try to derive a value for k. Okay? Of course, we know the equation of our question to be y is equal to k over x. So if values are known for y and x, you can simply find the values for k. k will be y times x. So once you have that value, okay, we create a model equation. From our original given equation, y is k over x, we impute the value for k. And we have y is, for instance, if k was calculated to be 10, our model value would be y is equal to 10 over x. Very important because this model will help us get our unknown. Now, either y or x, one of them will be known in the course of your question, and one unknown. So whatever value is given to us, let's take for instance, x is known. So you plug in values for x. If x is 5, y can be calculated to be 10 over 5, and this will give us 2. And that's how we find the unknown value. Okay, making use of the formula method. The proportion method, okay, this is much more faster to use. You simply create two ratios from the knowledge, okay, that you have. You can equate one set of values to the other sets of values. So in this instance, y1, x1 is equal to y2, x2. You set them equal to each other and go ahead to solve for the missing quantity. Let's see some practical examples. If y varies inversely as x, and y is equal to 4 when x is 3, okay? That's one set of information you need to digest. y varies inversely with x. How do we write that? We say y varies, okay, inversely with x. That would be 1 over x. Remember, it's not a direct variation. If it's a direct variation, it would be y proportional to x. But it's not, so that's the way we write it. And of course, we write that equation as y is equal to k all over x. k is introduced as the constant of proportionality. So y is equal to k over x. Now, we want to find a value for k. We need to find our constant of proportionality. We know the value for for y and x to be 3. It was given to us in our question. We said and y is 4, while x is 3. So impute those values here. We have 4 is equal to k over 3. Of course, if we carry out inverse operation on that, k becomes our subject of formula. k is 4. Multiply both sides by 3. 3 cancels out 3. k is isolated. So you have k is equal to 4 times 3 and 12. So we have a value for k, 12. Next, create a model equation. Okay, 
We already know this equation. Impute the value for k. So we have y is what? 12 over x. This is our model equation. Our model equation will help us to find the unknown. What is our unknown here? y is the unknown. Find y when x is 6. So we impute a value for x and we'll have a value for y. X is 6, so y therefore is what? 12 all over 6. 12 over 6 is 2, therefore y is 2. Very simple. Next example, we'll make use of the proportion method. If y varies inversely as x and y is 9 when x is 2, find y when x is 3. Again, y varies inversely. Immediately, we know that y is k all over x. And of course, to find k, which is our constant of proportionality, k is y times x, y x. Okay, so if you have a set of values for each situation, k which is constant, tells us that the sets of values are equal one to another. So our first set of value, y1, x1, will be proportional or in the same ratio as y2, x2. Let's go ahead to see the values given to us, okay? If y is 9 when x is 2, that means we have our first set of values as 9 times 2. 9 times 2 will be in the same proportion with the next set of values given. Find y when x is 3. So we have y2. x2 has been given to us as 3. 3y2. Three so we have 9 times 2 is of the same proportion to 3y2. And 2. Of course, this simply means that 9 times 2 is equal to 3y subscript 2. So 18 is equal to 3y, basically. y, therefore, is isolated by carrying out an inverse operation on both sides. So we divide both sides by 3. y is 18 over 3. And that is what? 6. Okay? So again, our steps set constant ratios equal to each other, which we did, and divide both sides by 3. Y will give us 6. Now let's take a look at some word problems. Like we said, real life scenarios in which we find inverse variation problems. For the choir fundraiser, the number of tickets Ada can buy is inversely Proportional, okay? So we've already been told to the price of the tickets. The number of tickets she can buy is inversely proportional. She can afford, for instance, 15 tickets that cost 15 Naira each. How many tickets can Ada buy if each costs 30 Naira? So the less the price, the more tickets she can buy. But the more expensive the price, the less tickets she can buy. That kind of relationship is an inverse variation relationship. So quickly, let's represent the number of tickets with the variable y. And also represent the price of the tickets with the variable x. We set up our proportion. Okay, First set of values that we have, y1, x1, remember? is in the same proportion as y2, x2. That is y1, x1 is equal to y2, x2. So if we know that, we can quickly impute our values. y1, x1 would be 15 tickets at 15 error each. 15 times 50 is equal to how many tickets can Ada buy if each costs 30 Naira? So we do not know that number of tickets, but we do know that they cost 30 Naira. So we have our expression. So 15 times 50, we have 750. And of course, that is 30 
y subscript 2. Therefore, our y will be 750 over 30. And that gives us 25. So y is 25. Another example, a car takes six hours to travel from Sokoto to Jos at a constant speed. How long does the same journey take for a lorry traveling at half the speed? A car takes six hours. To travel from Sokoto to Jos at a constant speed, how long does the same journey take for a lorry traveling at half the speed? Okay, so we'll quickly set up the equation of our relation. Remember, we said y is equal to k over x. k is what? y x. y representing the speed. And x representing our time. Okay? So we need to form our ratios. To form ratio 1, k is 6y. Because our speed is given to us as a constant. It's constant. We don't have a value for that. But we do know that it took 6 hours. So, k is 6y. On the other instance, to form our other ratio, before we equate them one to another, k is xy over 2. Because we know that the speed is halved. Remember, we said the lorry will take half of the speed. So if our speed here is y, speed is y, okay? y prime 2, that is the second ratio, is half of the value of our speed here. So that's y over 2. Therefore, our x, the time, which is the unknown there, is x until we get our value. How long? That's x that we are looking for. The time. All right, so we have the second relationship written as k is xy over 2. Our k is a constant, so for both ratios, they are same. We therefore quickly equate them. 6y is equal to xy over 2. We are interested in finding what x is, the time taken. So quickly, we carry out our inverse operations in order to isolate x. Multiply both sides by 2. We have 12y is equal to xy. To get x alone, divide both sides again by y. We have 12y divided by y. And that's 12. So we have 12 hours as our answer. If it took six hours to travel from Sokoto to Jos with the car, it would take 12 hours to journey or to go on that journey with a lorry. So our lorry is far slower than the car. Now we've come to the end of our class. I want to see if we can remember some of the things that we learned about. So let's do a quick recap. We learned what an equation is. Of course, I know that you know what an equation is. So we briefly uh, try to revise in our minds what equations are. We also learned what formulas are. We said formulas are equations that specify how a number of variables are related one to another. We said within a formula, whatever variable that is isolated on the left side of our formula is called the subject of that formula. And we said that other variables, okay, that we may be interested in placing emphasis on to become the subject Okay, can be done following some certain steps. So we carry out some of those steps and we carry out calculations on how to change the subject of a formula. I'm sure you remember all of that. Next, we went ahead to learn about direct variations. Okay, we said direct variations. Okay, it's a relationship that takes place between two variables that have the same ratio and are related directly one to another. We learned about the symbol of proportionality. And we said, for instance, y in this case is proportional to x. We said the equation is written as y is equal to kx, where k 
is the constant of proportionality. And finally, we learned about inverse variation. We said it refers to a relationship between two variables that go in opposite directions. As one increases, the other reduces. That is an inverse variation relationship. And we said the equation is of the form y is equal to k all over x. k all over x. Where k, we said, is a constant of proportionality. That was awesome. We have just two questions for us to shake up our memories. Let's see if we can remember some of the calculations. Okay? Let's try number one. X varies inversely as the square of Y. Given that X is 12 when Y is half, find the value of X when Y is 3 over 4. So quickly, first get this straight. This is an inverse variation question because we said x varies inversely as the square of y. So let's quickly write that down. x varies inversely as the square of y. Of course, this we can further write as x is k all over y squared. Now we've been given that x is equal to 12 when y is equal to half. So, to do this quickly, let's use the proportion method. Quickly create our constant ratios and equate them one to another. In this instance, k becomes xy squared. And of course, because they are constants, they can be equated one to another. We can have x1, y1 squared is equal to x2, y2 squared. So, let's impute our values. For the first end of our ratio, we have 12, which is our x, multiplied by y, which is half squared, is equal to, on the other end, we have the unknown x and the known y, which is 3 over 4. So we have x, our unknown, multiplied by y, which is 3 over 4, all squared. So this we have 12 times 1 over 4. And x times 9 over 16. To further solve this, 4 goes in 12 3 times. So we have 3 on one end, and we have 9x over 16 on the other end. Carry out our inverse operations, we have 3 times 16 on one end and 9x on the other end. 3 times 16 will give us 48 is equal to 9x. x we can get by dividing both sides by 9. So x is 48 over 9. And that will give us 16 over 3. That is, 3 goes in 9, 3 times. 3 goes in 48, 16 times. So we have 16 over 3. And of course, we can write that in the proper manner to be 5 whole number 1 over 3. Let's see which of our options has the correct answer. Is it option 1, 2, 3, or 4? Option 3, which is C, is our correct answer. 5 over number 1 over 3. All right, let's take a look at our second question. A is proportional to M, and A is 8 when M is 20. Find A when M is 15. That's one question. And the other question says, also find M when A is 7. So we have two sets of answers that we need to find, all right? So quickly, A is directly proportional to M. Of course, this tells us that A is KM. And of course, our constant of proportionality would be A over M. It means that we can set up two sets of ratios. 
an A1 over an M1 would be equal to an A2 over M2 because they are directly proportional one to another. So let's impute our values. Our A1 as 8, M120. Our A2 is yet unknown, soon to be found. And our M2 is 15. Okay, so to get our A2, we simply multiply both sides by 15. So we have 8 times 15 all over 20. This is 5. That will give us value for A2. 8 times 15 will give us 120. And of course, all over 20. A2 is there for 2 here will give us 6. So A2 is 6. Next, let's find M when A is 7. Again, let's write proportions for either side. Now we know our first set of values to be A1 is 8, M1 is 20. And now we need to find M when A is 7. So our A2 here is given to us as 7. And our M2 is the unknown. Okay? So how do we find our unknown? From what we've learned in change of subject or formula, what do we do? So first... We multiply all sides by M2. We have 8 M2 all over 20 is 7. Okay? We don't want fractions. To clear out the fractions, again, we multiply both sides by 20. We have 8 M2 is 7 times 20, which is 140. So 8 M2 is 140. M2, therefore, is 140 divided by 8. And that will give us 35 all over 2. If you divide both sides by 2, you have 4 here, you have 70 here. You have 2 here, you have 35. So we have 35 over 2 as our answer. To write it in its proper form, that would be 17 whole number. 1 over 2. Let's see which of our options has the correct answer for both sides of the question. Okay, is it A, B, C, or D? The correct option is option D. A, we derived to be 6, and M was calculated to be 17 and half. And so with that class, we've come to the end of our lesson for today. Our part two is something to look forward to. In that class, we'll learn about the other types of variation. We still have three other types of variation. It promises to be an exciting class. And I look forward to seeing you there. Bye-bye for now. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, drop a comment, and subscribe to our channel. You can also turn on notifications to stay updated on new videos on this channel. This Brain Friend video was brought to you by Synforest. For more of these amazing e-learning videos, get your copy of Brain Friend. With more than a thousand e-learning videos, over 74,000 test items in more than 40 subjects, a career counseling guide, and many other amazing features, BrainFriend remains your foremost e-learning and exam preparatory software. BrainFriend. Learn better. Make excellent grades.